my job, I hate to say it, it's very driven by fiat. And if you follow the money, it's like, well, where's this money coming from? And is that sustainable? It's large amounts of money based on taxes that are extracted in ways right now that if there was a Bitcoin standard, I think largely would go away. We, we both work in these fiat jobs. We both work towards a Bitcoin standard and those ideals. And it's like, you know, under a Bitcoin standard, would we have our jobs? Probably not. It really starts with the money. So much of this is rooted in the money and the systems of how that works. And it trickles down into what we're seeing here, whether it's a, an escape hatch or a great realignment, however we see it playing out. Bitcoin fixes this. A lot of communities are healthier. You don't need as many caseworkers. You don't need as many police. You don't need as many nannies going around fixing problem after problem after problem. And you have this cycle of like, we're just going to fix all these symptoms all the time. We, sh we should be uh, brave at, at, in some regard, we should be coming out and saying like, oh, I'm Robin Sire, I'm for Bitcoin. If you have questions, uh, come to me. Uh, if you don't yeah. like it, uh, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I think in a lot of people's Bitcoin journey, when you first start learning about it, you don't have the confidence necessarily. And, and to this day, I don't. Sometimes I feel like, um, gee, on a certain topic, like you get into... I'll be learning or I'll be discussing a topic with somebody and somebody gets into like aspects of mining or other things. And I I'm like, man, I don't know enough about this area or you don't always have all the confidence you would like to have when you are early into Bitcoin as well. You're learning, you're learning, you get excited, you hit these peaks and you get um, you can get sort of naively overconfident. But then the more you learn, you realize how much you don't know. Or if you're ever questioned about it or someone starts to, um, you know, it, it, for me, it can sometimes be family like, so, you know, how much financially at risk could you be here? And you have to, like, explain that and bridge that gap and translate it for them, like wherever they're at on their path. Like some people aren't going to understand a big picture with all that. And um, and it can be intimidating where it's like. A test of faith at times like am i really all in or if if someone i care about who is anti-bitcoin or you know who knows um starts to kind of ask hard questions or play devil's advocate or really you know try to you know push on you are you are you willing to stand up for that um with tactful friendly kind confidence um and if they judge you for it okay, uh, it's nothing personal. <laughs> um, or someday you kind of figure someday you may understand, but that's okay. You don't have to know now. And, and if you don't like me for it now, well, that tells me more about you than me being humble and just learning what I can for me. Um, and, I'll ha and then I'll be happy to share as I can, but I'm not pushing it. I don't need you to know everything now. I It took me years to kind of ease into my confidence and why it wasn't just oh i understand how it works but then but why bigger picture is this important and it it, it takes time so yeah it's it's, um, it's yeah. interesting because when you actually look at um like there are two types of people who ask critical questions the ones that are genuine and really try to understand bitcoin and the other ones that just try to like because they don't invest themselves, they want to make others that do invest themselves look like fools. And they're not yeah. genuine and they just wanna, they just basically wanna convince you that you did a bad job. And uh, I usually, when someone is genuine and actually has questions and, and I, I like uh, that they are open to it, then obviously I take sometimes even three, four hours on an evening to actually explain it to them. Uh, if someone is in general, I'm like, Hey, if you want to learn about Bitcoin, I can answer your questions. Uh, I'm not here to this, uh, to, uh, discuss or debate anything. Uh, it, it's, it's like, you can go on the internet and learn everything. Uh, you can come to me and learn everything. Uh, but I'm not in a debate club. I have no interest in debating any, anyone. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's why also, also the reason, because I don't invite on my podcast, uh, people anti Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. And that's exactly for that reason. I, I want to explore uh, thoughts and ideas. Uh, and when there's someone on the podcast that is only a little bit in Bitcoin and 
more about gold and more about real estate, I explore with them why they are so in, in gold. Like I had this mm -hmm. podcast on where not only like, I don't only invite Bitcoin maxes, I also invite other people. And when I invite them, I explore like why they are so in gold, why are they so in, in real estate and try to figure out what and understand what they're doing and mm -hmm. not debate why they should be all in in Bitcoin. That's debates are really emotional. They probably work really good online. People like to watch debates and it's emotional and it, wow, it's, it's cool. But I don't like to contribute to that. Uh, I want to have yeah. podcasts where I figure out what is the guest speaking about. And this is almost my, always my goal, uh, to give, um, the best stage possible for my guest and figure out what they are about and why they are doing what they're doing. That, that, that's basically my common goal with, with all the guests and also with you, Fritz. And I'm looking forward to, to today's one. Yeah. I, you know, it's a common question to ask is sort of like, what, what was your orange pill or what was your Bitcoin path? What, I mean, we're still on it, <clears throat> but, um, I, I find that interesting because people have meandered and uh, navigated their own path in different ways. And every single person who is different in many ways has a different story to tell about that. And, um, and it's not always, it, I mean, the path, the path is not always straightforward or easy at all. And at one point, you know, some years ago, I had hit this like early peak Bitcoin maxi excitement. Like, I'm going to tell everyone about this that I know, just like how cool it is, how important it is. And I was just I was needing people to know. And then I quickly ran into with random people, various reactions, it runs the gamut. People that I would care about that I think, oh, I bet you would like this or, you know, or this is important, like, say, for the future or for family. And when you get hit with concern or criticism, I learned, okay, all the relationships to me are very important. And I'm not going to like, you know, um, judge people over their Bitcoin path because it's not straightforward. Um, so I would just, I'd had to step back and say, I will always be interested and curious and willing to share. But if someone else is not ready, I completely just, I let it go because they will know someday to come to me if they, um, you know, understand enough or care or, you know, want to talk about it. They, they may be ready someday and it doesn't have to be now. Um, so I step back from being like, I'm going to like, just go around and evangelize everywhere I can. And I'm, I'm just going to be aggressively like all out. Um, I, I read people and if they're not ready, I'm not going to like turn them off because it seems like a cult or something. It's just like, oh, no, it's cool. No, nope, no big deal. You know, if you're ever curious, let me know. But uh, and then I'll approach it from where they are interested or what their needs are. And it may be like you said, you have a, a guest on that's more about land or gold or the politics or whatever. And I can frame it for that and kind of guide it towards what I see as, you know, being pertinent and you never know, everyone's different. And, uh, but for me, relationships are pretty primary. You know, I I'm, I'm human. I have relationships. I'm not going to burn relationships over something that may not matter for them ever or too late or, um, or later. It's fine. It can be later. The only exception that I make to that, and I 100% agree with that, the only exception that I make with that is when I see someone that really needs Bitcoin. When I see someone that like would benefit tremendously from it, I try a little bit harder uh, to get the idea across uh, and a little bit more often. Um, I had it rarely, but I met like... Uh, 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 so, some, like maybe two people in my life where I'm like, oh, they, they really need hope. <laughs> they, they really need, they, they are so frustrated with the financial system. Uh, and it's, it's kind of my obligation as a Bitcoiner to at, at least show them something else because they only see this fiat world and they kind of are almost depressed in this fiat world. And they're like, they cannot look outside of it and they are really depressed how it works. And, uh, just showing them that there's something else 
I saw like a small sparkle in their eyes and it's, it's fascinating to see when like, mm -hmm. oh, oh, okay. Um, actually prices should, uh, go down because everything we're getting better in producing it and it's deflationary and, and those, those mind breaking things that we Bitcoin not know, but for, for, for people that didn't do the research till now, it's like, wow, <laughs> it's like, actually, yeah. Yeah, this, this makes sense. If you actually sit down with them and explain it to them, it's, it's, yeah, it's fascinating to see. Yeah. Time, some time will go with like somebody who um, I'd mentioned Bitcoin too, and they push back and like, Oh yeah, right. Okay. Whatever. And I'm like, okay. And then later they might complain about the price of things or, um, the, the quality of things or just the politics about things. And I'll be, and I can, I, I, I have no problem of saying, you know, for me, I believe it really starts with the money. So much of this is rooted in the money and the systems of how that works. And it trickles down into what we're seeing here. Um, and whether it's a, an escape hatch or a great realignment, however we see it playing out, Bitcoin fixes this. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of drop that seed every once in a while and like it connects with them again it, and maybe it triggers something. So yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. And let's, uh, let's get started, uh, with, 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 with the, the actual questions that I have <laughs> with you, but this was a, a great pre-talk. Um, first of all, like welcome to the, uh, Bitcoin podcast scene. Uh, Thank you, 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 you started the, the podcast and it's always great because I think we need more voices. There are some people that say, oh, there are already so many great podcasts. And I'm like, uh, really? No, uh, because we are still like, how many people have Bitcoin? 3%, 4%, 5% uh, mm -hmm. of the world. Maybe uh, depending on how you count it, maybe we get up to like 8, 10%. But this is like, uh, you have to count people in that are invested yeah. in S&P 500 and have it through Tesla or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Then maybe more. But uh, most people don't have Bitcoin and even from those who have Bitcoin, only a small percentage actually understand Bitcoin. Like just yeah. because you hold some Bitcoin doesn't mean you actually understand what the underlying asset is. So we need more voices to explain Bitcoin and we need more voices to get more Bit uh, Bitcoiner in. And so uh, I'm always thankful and, and appreciate uh, everyone that comes on the scene and actually gives their voice, their name, their identity to Bitcoin. I, I love that so much. Uh, my first question is r right around that. Uh, what did inspire you to start the podcast and, and what's your what's your main goal with it? Yeah, so you bring up a good point, uh, you know, like you starting your podcast and it was it was another fresh voice um, and how how quickly things can grow and the when the signal is clear and when the quality is there um, and just, you know, you can have your mainstay go to's, but you know, you don't want to get tunnel vision on this stuff and you never know what kind of fresh ideas or new people might be out there doing different stuff and how it, how it integrates grassroots all over the planet. And so I feel like a lot of people probably feel a similar or have a similar experience when they start getting into Bitcoin. And you could go back to like certain early days. I mean, you, you see these funny things from, you know, 2013 or 12. Um, and to today where people have this juxtaposition or this, this weird double feeling where it's like, I am so late. It's, I'm late. If only I could have been earlier. And at the same time, we're also still early. So it's like, I'm, I, I'm late, but it's also early. And as I just kept studying Bitcoin and getting more, um, aware and, and interested in it and, and, and fully, understanding it in the future. Um, I realized I, I listened to podcasts for several years, just taking it in, taking it in. And you start to get familiar with uh, the the mainstays, the quality podcasts that are out there. And there were, there's many. And I was like, you know, I don't have a background in traditional finance. Uh, I, ha I do have a background in computer science and technology. And so I'm good at that, but it's just, I don't work in that realm steadily. So short of running a Bitcoin node and playing with that or getting lightning started and playing with that, I can do little things, but I'm just, I'm no genius here. I'm no genius there. What am I going to contribute? Um, but at the same time, I felt this burning sort of need to do something like I want to, 
not just for catharsis, but for my own learning and for my own sharing and feeling like doing something is so much better than just feeling like, well, kind of that loser think mindset of, well, other people are already doing it. I'll let them do it. And like, I missed out. I'm too late. No, <laughs> you can keep doing it or you can do something with your flavor. Um, and when I started to think about it for a while, I just thought, um, okay, I, um, I have a background in computer science and some tech that later shifted into law enforcement. And I work in law enforcement areas, criminal justice now. And my flavor, I'm an American um, and I'm a proud American, even as I know that I, I criticize my government, I somewhat separate government powers that exist and how that rolls out today with the roots and the themes of what created America and just how fascinating and kind of unique that was. And that to this day, it relates to things that people go through in the world to, you know, establish their sense of privacy, their fundamental human rights. How do you even fight for that? How do you win against a large power structure um, or if you feel oppressed or whatever, how do, how do grassroots communities band together and work together and over time defeat like an empire? I just find that stuff interesting. And I thought I started to see these parallels there with um, initially just American history, because that's what I grew up in, what I'm familiar with, what I learned growing up as a kid. And there were parallels as I learned Bitcoin with that sort of um, fundamental human spirit, rights to freedom, life, liberty, property, that kind of stuff. And with Bitcoin, as Bitcoin would say, be, you know, a regulatory attempts or criticisms, propaganda, misunderstanding, whatever, uh, that Bitcoin has had to um, fight and grow and be grassroots and distributed and stand up for itself and proof of work so um to and it, as it's grown and become global so i started seeing those kinds of parallels and i just i was like you know there are a lot of very specific things that kind of connect um about that where you know uh, I, I i was like you know the uh, like the declaration of independence um was a document that uh you know founding fathers in america put together and told king george hey Enough is enough with this stuff. We are going to do something different. And in a way that, I mean, well, certainly it took a lot of courage and it might have seemed a little crazy. And it, and not that it was a, a new idea to want to be free from a king, say, but um, it, it was a big, bold um, document that, that was issued forth and said, hey, here it is. And then Satoshi's white paper, you know, to, for Satoshi to write his white paper and put it out there, lay out the problem and a solution. And I, so there was like that and um, uh, early founding fathers as compared to the, all the various early Bitcoin developers, uh, uh, the Federalists versus Anti-Federalist concerns that went on in early America over how much power the central government should have versus the states or the communities um, with like the block wars, you know, how big should the block wars, uh, the block size be? Um, how distributed should it be? What's the risk of centralizing power in this space? You know, after two terms as president, George Washington stepped down and made it clear that, you know, no president should be king. And people were like, no, stay, you know, you are you know, you're the hero, just be president for as long as you're alive, because that was their thinking, you know, we, uh, we, we would love to have a king, you know, you're not a king, but we love kings. Um, Satoshi, after working and, you know, being becoming seen as potentially too much of an authority, he just walked away. And so there were those kinds of parallels that I was seeing through all that. And then I thought, you know, I think what my contrib contribution can be to this is, me being American, loving America's roots, uh, being a patriot, acknowledging the modern um, criticisms of America legitimately that, um, you know, you could say that America does in the world, um, various things that have occurred over the last, you know, whatever, you know, 50 years, 100 years. 
there are things to criticize about government structures, but the roots of that human spirit are all there. And I wanted to contribute something that compared that. Um, if you if you love where America came from and what those values were and are, how do that how does that relate to Bitcoin? Without making it too like obvious, like hey, this is that and this is that. There's a general parallel spirit that connects in these ways that we're all going through. And I thought that's interesting. I'm not going to make it too obvious, but I'll make videos about that and I'll make videos about this. And then you can draw your own conclusions, but it boils down to that sense of um, like a cypherpunk manifesto. Hey, we want to be free. We want to have life, liberty, rights to property. And it's revolutionary or does it have to be revolutionary? Maybe we need to make it revolutionary to make it clear that this is important. And if you're going to fight us, hey, we're not going away or or really, what are you going to do? And and for a lot of people that are understanding Bitcoin, people can easily kind of dabble in it. But if if things get weird or if there's, you know, whether it's propaganda or certain regulation or whatever, but Bitcoin still works. Bitcoin is still distributed and hashed and not beholden to, you know, if you don't want particular authorities. Um, are you are you do you value those ideas well enough to stand up for them, to fight for them? to not, you know, shrink away from it because, well, gee, well, maybe other people don't like it. You know, the founding fathers didn't do that. They, at, at, at severe risk to their lives and livelihoods, and many of them lost a lot, they did stand up and fight. And it wasn't a huge proportion of Americans. It was, you could say it was somewhat of a minority of Americans at the time initially that were willing to put it on the line and fight for that. And then ultimately, it's like, well, how did they, how do these colonies with new developing economies and you could say spread out, distributed, but well hashed proof of work communities defeat the British Empire? You wouldn't have thought that was easily possible. And yet the British Empire decided at a certain point, you know what, are we going to just keep fighting this? We're going broke. And they so we. Not only did they walk away, but we also fought back and defeated that. So um, that spirit is there, and that's partially what drives the idea of Satoshi's Militia. The the channel that I make and the brand that I have, Satoshi's Militia, is that play on, um, you know, if you imagine fighting for Bitcoin, evangelizing Bitcoin, being all in, um, but not like Satoshi's army. In in one sense, the idea of army is, for me... <laughs> An army is almost too centralized. Uh, what's the distributed version of what worked in the colonies? It was like militias, town to town and uh, village to village and in the woods, fate, you know, attack and fade. It's distributed and it's not attackable. The Native Americans, when, when the immigrants early on, you know, colonists came to America, they learned a lot from the Native Americans who lived on the land and were integrated with what works here. And there was a long, hard integration process, and it, it's ongoing. Uh, that's a hard part of American history that to this day we do have to reconcile and that uh, it, it, in certain senses is, is ongoing. But uh, America's learned a lot about living, you know, with and for their land in a distributed fashion and being sustainable in that sense. And so an empire saying, hey, you know, we're, we want a slice of that. We want control over that. We're going to tell you how to do that. And the colonists and the natives could say, no, <laughs> or, how, or how are you going to do that? Like, what are you going to, you going to occupy us all the time? And ultimately the British government uh, empire, they couldn't. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think that is qu quite often the way it works in history where um, a king or an empire can only occupy so much all the time. So when it's very well distributed and well hashed and proof of work, um, you can't control that. It's just, it's a force of nature. It's organic. It's not going away. It'd be like, we have a whole bunch of troops and we're going to walk out into the ocean at the beach and we're going to hold the tide back. Can't do it. The, the tide's coming in, folks. So yeah, get wet if you want, but you're not going to stop the tide. 
Is there um, an one example of the US Patriot history or one, one thing that like stands out for you that is really good comparable with, with Bitcoin, like the, the most comparable thing or the most important thing uh, that you see? A, a real poignant one for me, like I mentioned, was... See, one of the most amazing things about Bitcoin and what made it work was Satoshi walking away. The incredible genius of that and, and to remain undoxed from the very beginning, his operational security, building this amazing thing, and it was starting to become clear this is important and amazing and people are jumping on it and make and, you know, and it, it was so early. It was like, oh, my goodness, this is big. And he was willing at, you know, when he realized it's in good hands and he just really um, without much announcement or any, any fanfare whatsoever, he just simply walked away. He was like, hey, you know, here's here's access to the website. Here's the keys to this. Um, it's in good hands. And then where'd he go? Uh, that with compared to George Washington being president. And just walking away saying, no, it's time for an election. I'm going to go back to my uh, ranch and grow some tobacco and brew some, uh, distill some whiskey. Um, now, you know, he was a public figure and had a life, but um, it was that same sense uh, that that was a poignant piece for me. Um, another one, when the when the Revolutionary War, the American Revolutionary War started, troops had been occupying areas all over the, you know, coastal areas and inland for many years. And it was sort of grinding away on people who lived there with increased taxes, increased occupations. Um, the Boston Massacre, that was that was some years before the war started, but it just started to, um, you know, rub on the colonists in ways where they were really like, when do we fight back? How do we fight back? When it, it's like the water getting hotter. Like, when does the frog jump out of the pot? It's like we're just getting kind of used to this more and more. It's more and more. When is enough? Is an, when is enough enough? And so um, the the Battle of Lexington and Concord uh, started um, uh, April nineteenth, um, seventeen seventy. Oh, what year was that? Um, seventeen seventy six, and they. Um, uh, the British troops had heard that the American colonists were starting to accumulate arms and storing lots of gunpowder in these storage silos, uh, you know, west of Boston. And they were like, okay, we need to put a stop to that. These Americans have an escape hatch here, or they could fight us more significantly. Instead of just farmers with some muskets, they have some cannons and some gunpowder. And that, boy, that could be... Um, that could be a battle. So the British marched west from Boston, and we're going to seize that. And the militias got together and put up a fight. Just basically, no, you're, you're, you, it stops here. It stops at the bridge. And so when the British got, um, uh, when the first shot was fired, they call it the shot heard around the world, um, the war started effectively. That was the start of the war. Some people didn't know that this is the war yet, but that that's what started it, and it didn't stop till it was over. And so the the shot heard around the world. I could compare to, um, you know, whether it's the Genesis block issued or the first transaction made with Hal Finney. Um, it was sort of like, okay, you have this thing going on, and then that Genesis block goes out, and it's the start of the entire time chain. Um, or that first transaction goes to Hal Finney for what, you know, as money or, f um, as, as a means of value to anything, it had no like value at the time, but it was like that first shot heard around the world where like, we just did a transaction, uh, Bitcoin works, you can do this. And it was working. Um, so that's another one too. The, the shot heard around the world, the, when the revolutionary war started and then from not just white paper, but the actual first set of blocks and transactions. It just sort of sent the shot out there like, this is running, running Bitcoin. That's a good comparison that I like to think about. Uh, I love that. And I also think that, as you said in the beginning, um, that 
the anonymity of Satoshi Nakamoto is extremely important that he walked away and this project lived on and is growing ever since. Um, do you see it as a risk? I mean, I, first of all, like, I don't think Satoshi Nakamoto will ever come back. Um, I put it as a really low probability. I, he's probably either dead or just like, I, I don't know where he is or if he's alive or if he's even a, a man or a woman or a group of it. Uh, but, but the, the chances of him never returning, uh, getting greater and greater with every day. Uh, and it's like almost 99% or something like that, uh, maybe even higher. Um, but it's still a possibility that he comes back. Uh, do you see a risk when he would come back? Because all of a sudden the Bitcoin, um, opponents have a face and the physical party to attack, like, because then it's not about Bitcoin. It's all of, all of a sudden about Oh, Satoshi Nakamoto's character and Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, he wants to get rich and he wants to plug us exactly. or like, do you see that as a risk? I, not so much. And I have some, I don't know if it's unique and I, I want to be careful with what I say because I have some particular ideas about Satoshi Nakamoto and I, I, I don't want to, I almost don't want to describe my opinions on that too strongly because I, I wouldn't want to say anything that would like say dox Satoshi. I personally have specific ideas about the early American cypherpunks and the cryptography work going on, who was involved in that, the short list of people involved with that, and who Satoshi is. I believe, and I'm, so this is, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should know or that we need to know or that we, that's anything to pursue because the doxing part is important to protect. Um, sort of like just, just, well, was it yesterday or whatever? Business Weekly released an article about, um, a developer who helped basically start Noster and doxing, um, doxing the developer of Noster and trying to make it a hit piece about who this person is and blah, blah, blah. Not that it matters. I think it's, it's not going to matter eventually anyway. I think doxing Satoshi, it's natural when you start learning about Bitcoin. There's a question people run into where you, you're excited and Satoshi represents this godhead of Bitcoin. And, then, and there's a mystery there. Who, who is he? Where'd he go? He's, he's sitting on all this Bitcoin. What does that mean? What if he shows up and does, starts acting weird or sells it or, um, I think price wise, Satoshi could do anything he wants with his Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin's good. <laughs> Bitcoin's good for it. Satoshi could like sell it or whatever. Um, wouldn't matter. Maybe it affects the price temporarily. Uh, maybe it's more Bitcoin for me to be able to buy. Okay, whatever. The, the price of Bitcoin and fiat, I don't worry so much about. The idea as far as using that as propaganda that, oh, say we knew who Satoshi was. Um, I believe, and this is not, this is not, um, to make any reference to the idea that Bitcoin is not completely a global human owned and run system. Now it doesn't matter who Satoshi is at this point. Bitcoin is fine. That said, and it's, it, and when I say so with my brand, Satoshi's militia, there's nothing about Satoshi's militia. That's like co-opting Bitcoin that Bitcoin is American or that Bitcoin should be American. It's simply that uh, uh, if America is to remain strong, America should be in on Bitcoin. Americans should be pro Bitcoin and in on Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin's good for America, just as Bitcoin is good for any nation or any person, or if, you know, without nations, it doesn't matter. Bitcoin is good for people. I'm pro American. I'm pro Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin's good for America. America is good for Bitcoin. That's not to say that America should, you know, can exert any influence over Bitcoin or should. Or what, I know a lot of things like the ETFs and other things. Sometimes things start or are looked through the lens of an American approach. Or oh, you know, what's the SEC doing? What's, you know, what's, um, you know, what's the American government going to do about stuff? It matters and it doesn't matter in a way. Long term, it kind of doesn't matter, but. Um, 
But Bitcoin, I want America to be good for Bitcoin and vice versa. I do believe Satoshi is an American and that he's alive. I also believe that his integrity is so superb that he will not ever come back and I hope is never doxxed. Those are just my personal opinions. I have reasons for those. I wouldn't want to get into too much detail because I, I just would not want people to, um, out of just sheer interest, dox him. Um, there's a natural path people go into is when you start learning about Bitcoin and you start thinking, well, who is Satoshi? I want to know. You do some research and maybe there are knowable things about that. There are some knowable intelligence gathering things you could do about that that might lead you to know better who he is. Um, and I, when you learn, when you start learning that stuff or when you think you do, I think it's good that it's complicated and nebulous and distracted and that it's hard to know because it just, it, it shouldn't matter. I think it's very, it's, it's naturally fascinating history. Uh, and someday maybe we all know, uh, just through, you know, access to data and history and over time, it's it's a knowable fact. It's still too early to want to go there. So when you get excited about Bitcoin, you want to know about Satoshi, maybe you think you know, and you may legitimately have some solid evidence that you do, as I, you know, think I do. Um, I wanted to, I, I started to tell close friends like, hey, I think I know some, you know, here's what I think. And then I, I put a clamp on that to say, no, I don't talk about it because it's easily distracting. People focus on the Godhead type figure versus the movement. Um, it's a natural human thing. People do people get into a movement, whether it's a, you know, it could be something religious or a political movement, but people naturally as human animals, we want to place a face and a name to what that is or a person talking about it. It's it's this thing. And then you can attack a whole movement because you character assassinate a person who's kind of leading part of the charge. It's That kind of stuff is not good for Bitcoin. And so I just don't want to add to that. I also think that the government or uh, mainstream media or others could flagellate around that. Like, hey, did you know Satoshi Nakamoto? Blah, 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 blah. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, it might turn some people off from Bitcoin temporarily, but ultimately it doesn't matter because Bitcoin continues to run and work as, um, you know, like an asset and uh, whether it's, you know, just sound everything. So not to ramble on about that, but yes, I have specific ideas about Satoshi. I think it's still important not to go down a historical road too early about who he is and what he could do or doxing him, it would be unhelpful. Um, the I don't judge people's nat natural interest in who Satoshi is, but I think it's antithetical to the movement. And it's kind of a, a fiat thinking. It's kind of like, um, hey, uh, hey, you know who Satoshi is? Oh, let's talk about that. That's exciting. It's, it's kind of fiat thinking. It's kind of like, no, no. It doesn't matter, really. When you truly understand Bitcoin, we are all Satoshi Nakamoto. That's the point. We are all at this point Satoshi Nakamoto. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. 
It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in all of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. Yeah, th th this is actually the reason also because this is Satoshi Spirit uh, why I open license my whole podcast. So everyone can take anything from that podcast and use it in whatever way they think it is good. Because mm -hmm. uh, I don't see that I own this podcast. I mean, technically I own it. Like technically I can't enforce the rules and uh, don't copy me and stuff like that. But I'm, I have no interest in that because people can just take something. Maybe my guest said something really interesting. Maybe I said something interesting. They can clip that and distribute it. Uh, and if it gets a good reach, it's good for my podcast. It's good for the guest uh, and it's good for him and it's good for Bitcoin. Like, why should I put a stop on that? And YouTube has a tool where you can see uh, who used your podcast to what extent. Like I can actually see, oh, uh, he used 50% of my video, 60% of my video. What I do is I go to their YouTube channel and write a comment and saying, thank you for wow. distributing uh, the idea. Uh, and also when they credit me, I'm like, yeah, thank you for crediting me. You don't even have to do that. Like you like just just taking my podcast and, and putting it out in the world uh, that's that's something really great uh, and so I encourage everybody like even when someone viewing that and you see some clip of mine just take it uh, and distribute it wherever you want to it's it's marketing yeah. for me so it's even good thing for me I don't know why other people are like oh he took my my clip and I might like be <laughs> Be, be blessed be good about it like I, I, I love that and and this is kind of the satoshi spirit yeah. uh that i'm uh I, right now i'm not doing it anymore but in the early days of twitter i just took a meme from someone and was like giving my own thoughts to it and i forgot to credit one or maybe I, even sometimes i credit the wrong person they're like so angry about it right <laughs> uh, and it's it's kind of understandable from a human nature perspective but I just was like, okay, I will only use my own stuff. Like I, everything that I produce is now original. I don't even take memes from someone else now uh, because I want to respectful, be respectful. But on the other hand, everyone can take like whatever you want. And if, if you really exactly. want to take uh, something from my podcast and you, uh, because I put a logo on the top right corner, if you don't want the uh, logo and you have a good reason for that, Email me. I will email you the raw file. Like I don't care. <laughs> like you yeah. use it, make something with it, and that's the that's the true spirit of Satoshi Nakamoto. I feel like. Yeah, I think the true spirit of Satoshi. It's it's a it's a realignment to you know good quality community networking interaction grassroots relationships, and um, you know in America we have you know copyright law, and I know a lot of you know nations have copyright law, um, and. When you grow up and there's kind of, and it's to protect business and people's legitimate, you know, creations that they worked on and they want to protect. And I get it with the Internet and other things and just so much moving all the time in this information age. Um, I I think it's a it's good to have that spirit of Satoshi where, like, um, if you build something that you want to keep yours and you do you do things specifically to kind of make that clear um, or add your logo or whatever, you know, OK, you know, good. But memes are a funny space in this where, you know, I love, I love various memes and I'll just, I'll save them and I'll save them. And there's times where it's like, you know, I didn't make it or you've seen it a hundred times or different, different versions of something, but we're just sharing them or like, oh, this is, you know, this applies here. And the meme space is a way where, man, I tell you, I, I steal them. I'll reshare them. If I, if, if there's somebody to attribute, or if there's a logo on it, I try to just, you know, leave that. Okay. Yeah. Maybe this is somebody's, I didn't make it, but I'm sharing their, I'm sharing their art. And it adds to that spirit of sharing collaboration. Hey, steal my stuff, reuse my stuff, use the brand. It's, I'm not possessive. I'm not territorial because that's fiat. That's fiat thinking. Not that there's not a time and a place to protect private property. People have private property that may be theirs and they should, you know, have their, you know, have their reward for their work. Uh, but 
in uh, Nostr was an interesting thing for this too, where when I use Nostr a lot and the value for value stuff where you like, you know, you can like something, you can zap them some stats, uh, some sats. Um, or I, I post something that somebody likes and they zap me and you're, you're providing value for value and saying, you know, Hey, thank you. And we're sharing. And whether I get some sats or I send some out, we're, we're appreciating each other and sharing. It's more about the ideas and the vision and the knowledge and that we're mo We're all in this together. And it's not about, well, I made this and I'm going to keep it. And you want some, I'm going to sell it to you. Um, there are times and places for that to occur, but so much of the space is so collaborative and distributed. It's like, Hey, let's just do as much as we can every way we can. And let's share it together. Mm, yeah, I, I love it. And an artist should be always be, Uh, thankful when someone else shares the art, no matter how he does it. It's like uh, a, bi a big thing. Yeah. Um, but let's come back to, th to the topic. Um, you are also working in, 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 in your field job as a law, enf law enforcement. Um, yeah. Which is really interesting for me when I talk about uh, Bitcoin and how uh, nations can be like how the world could be nationless how and Bitcoiners are also sometimes talking about this idea, how Bitcoin will completely change how we all interact with each other and mm -hmm. how we setting rules and how we enforcing those rules, uh, uh, like with private uh, courts, uh, with private law enforcement, maybe with like uh, other ideas that is uh, different than we are used to it now. Um, With you working in, in law enforcement, how do you envision the, the, the future of law enforcement, the future of nations, the future of police? It's a really big topic area, and I don't see any of this. What, what my friend and I, uh, you had him on your podcast fairly recently too, Daniel White. He's my compadre in a lot of my work we do together on Satoshi's Militia's podcast. And he's writing a book called The Great Realignment. He helped me understand that I think the way Bitcoin is going to change society in all the most multifaceted ways all over the place is that it's going to be a slow, steady realignment. What, what Daniel's book is called The Great Realignment. Some time ago, I, when, I, when I really started learning Bitcoin and seeing its capabilities, and I think it's easy to kind of ima imagine, it's sort of an easy black and white way to view it as like, oh my gosh, this is going to change the world, it's going to blow up, and stuff's going to just break down and fall apart. It's going to be like a real sudden hard shift, and, and that could be a fight. Or there's people that will never get it and will have fun staying poor, blah, blah, blah. I, I kind of get that. I mean, yes, there is that potential in ways, not broadly, but there's going to be microcosms of just system failure. Um. You know, people, the, the, the zombie trope, uh, societal breakdown, people can kind of imagine like, well, what would I do? Um, society falls apart. I got, I got my arsenal and my food and, and I could survive or Bitcoin's my escape hatch and all this stuff. Daniel and I feel more and more that it's not going to be something so drastic. There'll be just a slow, steady propagation of what works better and maybe a slow, steady in fits and starts you know, pops of failures, bank failures, political failures that also will just basically what doesn't work so well is going to diminish in value and strength. And that that great realignment will just sort of seep its way in, starting with money and individual treasuries and then state treasuries and retirements and then na national treasuries and, you know, banking system stuff. It's going to creep its way in, creep its way in. And then as we experience it today, as the money drives the, you know, social systems we experience, it's going to seep in there as well. It's it, Bitcoin for me, one of the biggest things it did for me was related to time preference. I didn't realize how much time preference affected my day to day thinking and my, my, my fiat thinking and my goals in life. And so when you start like slowing down your time preference and prioritizing a lot of things, you start looking differently on things like justice. Um, I have friends who are very libertarian, um, staunchly libertarian, or others that are like that ANCAP libertarian. 
I have others that are sort of reformed libertarian or sort of criticize libertarianism and say, well, um, yeah, in aspects, libertarian values are going to start to happen. But are we looking at decades or a century from now that like nations go away? Um, I think it's very possible that we always have nations. We always have kind of certain lines drawn in certain ways, different languages, that we have different cultures that band together for reasons with a name and a title and boundaries because it does work in a lot of ways for a lot of reasons. And it's how we just kind of keep things organized and get our minds around how we interact in large groups of people. So I could say I never see that going away. Uh, co collaborative, uh, you know, collaterally, I also see for the same reason that governments that help run these nations aren't going to just go away. They will, you know, we're, we're going to have nations. We're going to have governments that work for those nations and for the people. The way they do that will start to change over time both through what simply works, like what's sustainable financially or sustainable through people's tolerance of their rights, um, but also driven by, you know, individuals in those nations with different expectations, uh, different, uh, different empowerments. They're empowered, perhaps, by things like Bitcoin or their perceptions on time preference. They're going to, in some areas, they're going to say enough is enough here, but also don't stop doing this over here. We appreciate that. So keep doing that. So what works better will continue to grow. What doesn't work well will have to go away. Bitcoin is going to help drive that. And it's going to be a flywheel that grows and grows and grows in momentum. And then you can't, and you can't stop it. Governments and nations are going to have to get on board to operate under that paradigm if they're going to survive. If they don't, they either go broke or they have like a, re a revolt from the people, I, I think, eventually. I don't think people necessarily want conflict or gravitate to conflict. I think generally people are sort of risk averse and want to get along. And I think if the money is fixed, the systems that enforce that are going to align themselves in ways that simply just start working better and aren't a big calamity. Um, now, are we not going to have a calamity? I don't know. It, I mean, it could be that, yeah, things really collapse and the government is like desperate and says, we have a CBDC and you got to get on it. There's a new dollar. You have to register, get an account. You're going to get free money. It's enforced. Bitcoin's illegal. Yada, 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 yada. I can see that happening for a temporary, you know, fight, but it can't be, it's not going to work long term. Now, when it comes to my job and when you think of law enforcement, um, when you think of like the police, the police are part of the government. They're not paid short of um, public funds, which are extracted from taxes. If the tax system is, was to, if the money was to get fixed and that were to affect the way the tax system can work and the way governments can collect money and the way their fiat is failing and how they can even spend that fiat, Governments are going to have to make hard decisions about what they prioritize, how much money they're spending for all kinds of everything. Some of that is the military, law enforcement, control structures, obviously, criminal justice, uh, legal enforcement. They're going to have to start doing that in sustainable ways. So it's not going to be this extra like, you know, we're going to just invade that nation because we can. And the only way we can afford that is to steal their stuff. Um, regardless of any excuse or reason they make about it to justify that, um, that's going to be unsustainable. You can't do that. Uh, now, policing is very dispersed and jurisdiction by jurisdiction. It's easy to see cases of police work where you, you get a random story from somewhere where something bad happened. I mean, my dad just yesterday told me about a story. Hey, did you hear about this thing in Little Rock, Arkansas, and this police uh, no-knock warrant search thing that happened and a guy got shot? I'm like, what? And, you know, bad things happen. You hear about them. And whether it's, whether it's the, the CIA, the FBI, state troopers at some level, county deputies, local municipal police 
folks on the beat. They are human and they're doing a job that they're paid to do. They're probably not going to do that job unless they're paid. Um, and large organizations that do that can be corrupt. They get corrupted. There are ones that exist today that are corrupt. They get popped. They run into trouble. People are tolerating less of that bull crap. And so they're, they're realigning uh, today, just in an information age, they have to respond to the demands of the people and work. Ultimately, they serve the people and the public interest. If they don't, they get called on it. Um, maybe not as quickly as people like. You know, the wheel of justice grinds very slowly and it, and people sometimes want the fix now. So they, they want to do, they want to take drastic measures to fix that. It is improving. It's just very slow because it's a very large dispersed system and it happens community to community. But from the top down, it's going to have to realign in some ways to a financial system that pays for that. So if the money's fixed, the nature of the mechanisms that fund things like, say, policing will also have to align with what's sustainable. It may be that the services that the people get from that are different. If we were under a Bitcoin standard, you know, what would policing look like? It's really hard to fathom, but it, it may very well be that um, people are served in ways that they're more willing to actually fund or invest in more personally instead of you simply get taxes extracted and it's just going to come down on you the way it is. I think there, there'll be more of an integration with what's sustainable and supported by the people and paid for how by the people. It's hard for me to imagine how that'll look. A libertarian view on that might be that, hey, um, it could operate privately and it could be people will fund or invest in what they want if it's worth it to them. That may or may not work in every community. It may be that poor, disenfranchised communities that don't have a good, you know, network going for them can't afford the services they'd like to have. And in other in other places where it's doing well, like a community organize an organized community can is is uh, connected and has a culture willing to recognize that, hey, you know what? It's worth having some security in our community. So it's worth paying so much for that and sustaining that for good reasons because you don't want bullies going around stealing your stuff or, you know, or, you know, responding to crisis. Somebody gets hurt. You need people to, to know how to take care of that. And are they going to always do that for free? Not necessarily. <laughs> I tell you, if, if, you know, if um, if power structures or just, you know, police, if if you stop paying them, they're not going to go to work. So if you're going to have police, you got to pay them. If you're going to pay them, you got to do that on a on a money system that is sustainable. I think largely it can be. But visualizing what that looks like under Bitcoin standard, honestly, I'm really not sure because I think it's very complicated. Um, I think that's kind of the. Humanity's next big um, challenge, not challenges, but, you know, where we're graduating to is reconciling and navigating how we take these next steps as humans on the planet. Having these structures or services, programs, support for each other that are good for people, that people need and want um, and that we want to take care of each other naturally. But then how do you deal with problems in a way that the people want and that you can also sustain, sustain financially under good money? We're used to a welfare state or a fiat state. And so you just kind of think, well, the government will fix that. Or somebody needs to do something about that. Why, why don't the police do something? Why doesn't the government come in and take control? Um, it may be that... <clears throat> You know, under when there's emergencies or there's problems, we are so used to just millions of dollars coming down in the form of support from a higher central authority. We're kind of used to that. If that were to go away in a lot of ways, we're left more to our own distributed resources. And then it can be very, it can seem unfair because people in one community may not get 
that done well enough, and in others, they're fine. Um, I think it's more doable in an information age where we have good communication and a lot of networking among communities. I think how power structures or, or large organizations do that under sound money is not completely clear right now. And, mm -hmm. and that's, or maybe it is to some people. Daniel and I have talked a lot about this in our podcasts, and I struggle, I get stuck in a fiat brain sometimes, and I struggle with knowing how exactly that'll look. And I just don't think it'll be very consistent all over the, all over the nation or all over the, the planet. Uh, we may see a lot of sort of, in a way you'd call it disparity. You're going to see some disparity where we're having this realignment, but it's happening better in some places and less well in others. And you can criticize that. I, I just think that's the natural orga organic process of the great realignment. Someday, I'm an optimist, but I think that someday we will figure this stuff out. It'll get more consistent. There'll be standards to follow. We have good standards now. It's just how do we maintain those sustainably um, that's not fiat? Um, it is a different paradigm. Uh, I, I think that a lot of things that I do in my job, it, my job, I hate to say it, it's very driven by fiat. Uh, uh, large chunks of my budget, um, and, I, and I'm the director of a fairly small organization that supervises people in our community. And a huge proportion, I mean, it's all tax dollars, obviously, but a huge proportion of it is grant money that is beholden to things that the state wants. Um, and if you follow the money, it's like, well, where is this money coming from? And is that sustainable? It's large amounts of money based on taxes that are extracted in ways right now that if there was a Bitcoin standard, I think largely would go away. So my job would go away. So if my job and my department goes away, how does that look for the community if people are not doing well in the community? You have people who have mental health problems, have drug addictions, are criminal thinking. They're going to do bad shit. Mm -hmm. How do we respond to that as a community? And, um, and can communities grapple with that without, say, that guy or that team of people who know what to do and are saying, hey, you know what? There are times and places where we take away your rights. You're going to be arrested. You're going to go to jail. It's like, hey, those are my human rights. You can't do that. Or if I can beat you. I'll win and you can't do that to me. And you got bullies fighting bullies. Um, I think there's still a way to have a system that we have now that's supported by a community that's funded by sound money, but that happens organically. It may not, it just may have to be efficient and responsive to the people. It can't just exist because it exists and next year's budget's got to be better than last year's because, well, we're just growing, we're doing more just because. I think it's going to have to be nimble and responsive. And if, if there aren't problems, you're not there. If there's a problem, then you have to muster and shift gears. It's a different mindset about how that works. Um, my job can be pretty bureaucratic at times. Um, it, like you say, you get a government job and you, you got a stable, a stable, secure job. Uh, you're going to get your retirement, your pension under this fiat. Um, that thinking around how government works may have to get nimble and responsive and not just exist because it's just existing. It's going to have to adjust to the needs of the people. Um, that doesn't really answer the question, but it's a, it is a complicated question. Yeah, and it's an extremely broad topic. I think we can mm -hmm. like talk probably like hours and hours just on, on just on that one there were so many interesting um thoughts in there that you'd explained and uh it's really interesting also how, how you think about that and it's, it's it's the thought is becoming clearer and clearer i asked that question or similar questions quite often in the podcast uh and almost everyone agrees that there will become some change and almost everyone says it's unclear to them how exactly this looks because it's just impossible to answer. Uh, mm -hmm. But time will tell. And in general, I think a Bitcoin standard will be much better than a fiat standard in every way. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but we will have an interesting transitioning time there. 
Um, because once we figured out uh, law enforcement on a Bitcoin standard, it will be great. But this might take some time from this downslow of the fiat system to the uprise of the Bitcoin or sound money system. There will be a transition time where not everything is is perfect. And, and I think this we should accept that, that it's, it's okay to grow. Uh, it's a growing pain is a real thing. Like I'm two meters mm. tall. When I was small, I had a lot of growing pain uh, in all my joints because of that. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we should not grow. And this mm -hmm. is, I think the, the best comparison I, I could make with that. Yeah. We're going to have to figure it out. And, and, and it's not straightforward. I, I think the, the idea of Bitcoin standard kind of makes now from a sound money point of view. Yeah. It'll be a standard from how that integrates in society. It's not going to be standard everywhere you go. It's going to be different in every community. Every community is different. Every community's needs different. And it, it's going to be a lot more grassroots and uh, the roots are going to be wide and distributed. And it, yeah, like I said, it may be, um, it may be hard in some areas to sort it out. And in every community, it's going to be like, oh, we have a new challenge. We have a new problem. Oh, this emergency happened. How do we, how do we do that? How do we rally together in new and different ways? I think we're quite capable because we've done it many times in history. Um, you know, well, so for example, the Satoshi's militia brand, you know, the, the colonies were way distributed, argued amongst themselves, didn't disagree. Every community was different. The South to the North, the coastlines to inland farmers versus the uh, fishermen. It, it was very diverse. And when the, but when the British Empire came or there was some problem, it was like, okay, despite all differences here, something came up. We can come together, come to common ground. What do we need to do for all of us together? And they figured it out. We've, we faced it with, um, you know, public health concerns or, um, you know, certain attacks on things. I, I think people in every nation are capable naturally of um, coming together, I think there's an in, there's an inherent interest in taking care of others. It's easy to be cynical in this day and age of like, well, I got mine. Good luck to you. Um, people just naturally are really not that greedy. Even even as kids, uh, you can readily learn to share and play together. I think we all do it naturally, I, and I think adults today. When there's a problem, um, people will swoop in to help if they can. And I think that natural, pro, uh, that Latin, that natural inclination is going to help us all get through hard times. Times, you know, so times could get hard, if you will, because they're going to be very different. Or when problems occur, we don't know how to navigate them as well the same way we did before. We're going to have to figure it out. So it may be clumsy at times, but we're also going to figure it out. And it's going to grow organically. And I, I feel hope there. In my mind, it's kind of funny. Daniel and I were talking at our last podcast about we, we both work in these fiat jobs. We both work towards a Bitcoin standard and those ideals. And it's like, you know, under a Bitcoin standard, would we have our jobs? Probably not. So meanwhile, you're working a job. I, you know, I need to get paid. I have a family. I, I, and it's, it's good work. We do good work. It's just under the fiat paradigm. If if their great realignment were to happen kind of quickly, what would that mean for me? It could be that, you know, I got to figure out a different way that I work. I got to do something different. I can't just hold on to the, the way it's always been because it doesn't work that way. The money's not there or whatever. Um, whatever comes new, hey, I'm there for it. I'm capable. I'll do it. Uh, I think people will adjust. Some not as well. And that's going to be you're going to see some, you know, you're going to see tragedies that happen or people that have hardship. I also think you're going to see a lot of success as over time we figure it out and it becomes more organic and distributed. Absolutely. And it's, it's a, I think it's a great way to, to get in our end routine of the podcast, a great ending point here. Uh, we have an end routine in the podcast uh, that is now two parts. Uh, the first part is a question of mine that I ask now, uh, every podcast, uh, every Bitcoiner, um, because I think Bitcoiners are such interesting persons. And the second part is then the end routine that I have since the beginning, where the previous guest asked a question for the next guest. Um, the first question that 
comes from me and uh, I'm really passionate about is what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? And I ask this question because uh, I think Bitcoiners are interesting people and we can learn from each other uh, outside of the normal topics about Bitcoin, sound money, history, how will this go? And so, so like, what are you currently passionate about? Uh, what are you learning? What are you doing? What is, is there anything that stands out to you? One, one core area of my life right now, really it's, it's my family. And so I have, I have three older boys and then a little more recently, I have a two year old daughter. And so I've raised boys for many, many years, and one's off to college, another one's heading that way. Um, and I'm used to raising boys. What I've been learning <laughs> more recently in my life is raising a young daughter. And I've just been fascinated how in various ways she's just inherently different than her older brothers and her personality, her interests. And then also me as a dad, I've I'm a better parent now because I'm, I'm a more experienced parent, you know, just from years of doing it. And my approach to her with a new child has been more emotionally wrapped up in her well-being. Um, not that I wasn't with the boys. I, I love all my boys and we have great relationships. And so there's something about being a father to a young daughter um, or just uh, as a, you know, having a daughter. There's something different about it that I found really fascinating. Naturally, I just I feel very emotionally connected and, and the love I feel for her is interesting and very caring. And I feel very protective of her. And um, I've been learning new new skills as a as a parent of a young one as I age that are um, I found fascinating, just like, wow, this is different. So my family is a big priority of mine. So being a good dad is a is a big area of interest of mine. Um, now, collaterally, I like tech. I like all kinds of tech. Um, so I've always been fascinated in keeping up with, um, you know, for example, like where vehicles are going, um, things about like self-driving, Tesla, um, uh, SpaceX and the rocket uh, efforts going on and where we're going in that direction. I am very fascinated about what humans potential is in the space of technology integrating into our lives, whether it's day to day travel or someday exploring elsewhere. What I've, I, I, um, I have a drone license, a uh, pilot license from the FAA to fly drones. So I've, um, I'm not a, I'm not a aircraft pilot, but I'll, I'll fly drones and I like making videos of, you know, I'll take my drone with us on vacations and then I'll fly it down the beach or around the mountain. And, um, I like piloting drones. That's an area of interest of mine. I'll make videos and just fun landscape bird's eye view of things. Um, so that's a nerdy interest area of mine making video work. Um, so aside from my family, and then technology generally, I like to think big and kind of futuristic about where we're all going. Like even 100 years from now, what, what will things look like? I like thinking about that. And, and then I, I apply it to making my own videos around Bitcoin and flying my drone and making videos that are like flyover type videos and raise my family, studying Bitcoin. And then Monday through Friday, daytime, sometimes after hours calls. I work in criminal justice. <laughs> and so like, it's a different world. <laughs> I go to my day job and I work in this area and grind away and save lives. And then I go home and take care of my family, forget about work, try to separate work from life and um, play in my tech hobby space. I love it. It's, it's really great. Uh, I think there's a, there's a balance to it and, and I love what you're doing. Um, to the end routine of the, the previous guest, uh, the question is uh, to you, what problem does Bitcoin solve for the industry you are currently working in? I mean, we kind of really touched on that whole topic already, but do you have any anything to add uh, to that question? I could go deep with this because I think the long-term view on what Bitcoin fixes goes deep into society. And the problems that I help manage and try to 
stop are deeply rooted human fundamental human problems. It's part of the human condition. It can connect with drug addiction, like I mentioned, drug addiction, mental health, criminal thinking, broken families, people with trauma for various reasons. People hurt people. And then hurt people hurt people. And it can be a cycle. There's a lot of trauma and societal decline out there. And there's, you know, homelessness, all that stuff. Drug addiction, uh, people who are houseless, they, they start having mental health concerns. The medications and the technology and the incarceration and all these systems we have now to try to fix that work to varying degrees, but in, imperfectly. And you can throw a lot of money at that to try to fix it. But um, change is hard and change is slow. There's no real fix to this. These are, these are problems that I think humans will always have. It's sort of like, you know, is Bitcoin going to stop conflict or stop um, traumatic events? Or, or is everyone just going to get along? No. We, people are going to fight. People are going to have problems. People are going to make mistakes and make bad decisions. Uh, greed can set in and people can be criminal. All this stuff. What Bitcoin realigns for society is healthier people. It's a healthier mindset. If your goals are long term, uh, it's it's um, you know if human society goals are long term and investing forward and not just short term like get your fix now or get your money now buy your stuff now, it aligns society in healthier ways. If you align all of society in a healthier way. The symptoms of the root problem, the symptoms start getting better too. You have less people drifting to short term gains of crime, drugs or alcohol, uh, gambling, uh, hurting other people. Not that people won't make mistakes, but people are going to start, stop thinking so short term because they understand a longer term picture. That is going to reduce crime. It's going to reduce conflict it's going to reduce the outcomes of that which are all the troubles you see with people so in that regard i think what it fixes for my job in the long term is that communities are healthier and if communities are healthier you don't need as many caseworkers you don't need as many police you don't need as many nannies going around fixing problem after problem after problem and you have this cycle of like we're just going to fix all these symptoms all the time and we can't stop People from the ground up will all start doing better. And then the people will start having less of those problems. And it's just a generalized societal health. I, I look at law enforcement and criminal justice. The, the work we try to do is often in the public health spectrum. It's not a moral question of right and wrong and good and bad. Yeah, there are bad things in the world and people do bad things. But the approach to that, from my view, is often a public health approach. It's not just fixing symptoms and, oh, you did bad, we're going to lock you away. Or we're going to arrest you. Or you're going to be punished. Why did they do that? The root causes of that are a public health thing. It can come from trauma. It can come from addiction. It can come from mental health. It can come from lack of housing. If you can solve the things that contribute to uh, homelessness or drug addiction or mental health problems or people's greed and suffering and criminality, you make my job easier. And Bitcoin fixes that. Yeah, it, it basically gets really deep in the, in the human behavior even, in the, in the human uh, incentives. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the, the guest that I had yesterday on uh, said, Bitcoin fixes and solves for human behavior, uh, and it's it's uh, I resonated a lot with, with his message around around that. But yeah, I I love the the talk with you. Uh, it, it was really really cool. Uh, it was really insightful. Uh, thank you for for being on, uh, and thank you for for being a guest on on my show. Um, Thanks for having before, me. Before I let you go, um, where can people find you? Where can people ask you questions? Where can people uh, reach out to you? I'm largely so I'm I'm on Noster a lot. You can uh, my NPUB's on my Twitter, my X account. You can see it there, and on my YouTube channel, Satoshi's Militia, all one word, Satoshi's Militia. 
you can find me on X, Twitter, YouTube. I'm on Noster and, um, and my end pubs on my Twitter. You can probably search me on Noster if you know how for Satoshi's militia. Um, I think they're my, probably the only Bitcoin militia out there. Um, so that's probably the best way to find me that way. And I, I put out regular YouTube channels, uh, YouTube videos on my channel. Um, uh, I largely orient my Twitter activity to my videos and occasionally something poignant. But, um, you know, when you have a daytime fiat job, I'm fitting in what I do with my videos, you know, after hours at times. Um, so I'm not really active all the time on either Nostra or Twitter, but my videos are every few days, new videos rolling out. My Satoshi Militias videos and podcasts we do every week. Uh, amazing. Uh, love it. Then uh, thank you for being on and for everyone listening and watching. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you.